Okay, now we're going to open our first round of uh, discussion, and I wonder whether we have already thoughts, comments, questions in the room. So while you're getting ready, uh, Sir Rakesh, I will uh, ask you about a very practical question, something I have faced a couple of days ago. One of my patient, uh, fantastic young lady, relatively young, <laughs> uh, who was included in the IMROS trial. Yeah. So she has been receiving isatuximab and VRD uh, for the last almost five years, I think, and now she's starting to progress, which is unfortunately can happen after more than five years of complete remission. So for such patient who is triple class exposed, likely refractory because she's progressing, uh, given what you have shown us, what is uh, your treatment shows, what, what is the decision-making process? There may be not a good or bad answer, wrong or right, but Absolutely. How, how do you decide for such patient? She's still fit, she's around 70. Four, I think, uh, no comorbidities, and then same question to you, Martin. Yeah, so, 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 so this is the sort of patient we're increasingly um, seeing and are coming into our clinics. This is a patient who's quad exposed, but potentially triple class refractory because the stops um, in, in the immoral clinical trial. So we've got a CD38 um, imid uh, refractory patient uh, and a PI exposed patient. So it, it starts to get a bit challenging. That is the ideal patient who is fit, who you would like to offer a BCMA-targeted therapy. Now, of course, you may not have access to that, so you may think about a carfilzomib-based regimen because the patient was PI-exposed but potentially sensitive. So, of course, the carfilzomib regimen, such as KCD um, or KPD, um, would be acceptable, but these are unlicensed, so you may have some resource restrictions. But I'd be very interested in a BCMA-targeted therapy. Um, I think Martin will show you the DREAM7 results, which show very good results with belantamab uh, dexamethasone and the DREAM8, which is belantamab pomalidomide dexamethasone. That works very well for a 74-year-old. But of course, if you do have access to CAR T-cell therapy, then you may want to consider giving CAR T-cells, particularly for a fit 74-year-old. There is a little bit of debate, having said that, because Tilta cell is approved as second line of therapy, but we do know that there is an incidence of late motor neurotoxicities and there is an increased risk of second malignancies. So there is a bit of a debate as to whether we should give that as second line therapy or we should reserve that as third or fourth line therapy. But that is my thought process think, at the moment. So, Martin, and then I'll ask you a question about uh, uh, this issue of toxicity of CAR T cells, especially Silta cell, because I think yesterday we had a very nice real world uh, large series published in Blood raising some concerns about these uh, uh, late toxicities. But, Martin, how would you handle my patient? And I'll tell her that I had a multidisciplinary meeting for her <laughs> in Mondelieu. I, I think. Uh uh, generally, you know, I agree with all the points um, uh, that Rakesh already raised. Of course, there is um, uh, also patient uh, factors that, you know, I think for joint decision making are of importance. You know, what, what is the preference of the patient? For example, the uh, CAR T cell therapy, apart from the toxicity, also uh, is, is a one off treatment which can be beneficial but nevertheless requires an inpatient stay and around uh, the procedure at least quite intensive. Uh, monitoring being close to the hospital uh, and maybe some off-the-shelf therapies sometimes can be uh, you know less daunting on some of our patients in that respect uh, I think there is of course also especially with carfilzomib uh, uh, regimens the infusion frequency that uh, uh, patients normally undergo if you do it per label it would even be twice per week infusions many of us I think are uh, very clearly using the once per week uh, carfilzomib infusion regimens but nevertheless that doesn't really stop uh, and of course, then th there are there is the alternative options. I guess also of PVD. I think the efficacy is not okay. as uh, convincing. I guess or not as long progression-free survival reported in the trial as with other options. But in some countries, the bortezomib can be subcutaneous. It can be maybe even administered out of hospital. There can be certain advantages. Uh, uh, by that regimen. But I think if we think about infusion frequency, of course, there is also uh, um, uh, treatments like uh, Belamov uh, combinations that have relatively infrequent uh, uh, hospital visits in terms of uh, um, infusions of the drug. So I think 
It's really um, not only the, the factors about fitness that I think in this patient um, we hear really gives quite a lot of choice because the, the patient is relatively fit. Uh, I mean, you can go to the very extreme of, very, of an, an all oral regimen, of course, as well, something like cyclophosphamide PD, uh, uh, for example. But I think we're, we're then having a trade-off against efficacy. And that speaks, of course, a different language than what we just heard, that the attrition rate at later lines of treatment becomes mm -hmm. higher and higher, and we probably want to use more efficacious therapies early on. So it looks like you're, both of you are actually favoring something which is highly effective, but also convenient, like CAR T cells single shot mm. or belentemab with uh, reduced frequency. Uh, maybe we can take one question and then we'll go back to our debate. Please introduce yourself. Following Dr. Mothi's patient and question, uh, in my country, for example, in Spain, I have access now to uh, El Renata map or Teclista map. Between those two options, which one would you choose? So the, 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 the question is uh, about bispecifics. And we yes. know that in many European countries, we have both teclistamab and ranatamab. So your question, you, you want to give her a bispecific, yes. but then you would like to know how to choose between teclistamab and ranatamab, <laughs> which yes, is a bit you. complicated. But I don't know whether you have any salt. Yeah, it's an I'll take my joker for this. <laughs> It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think you're fortunate that you can use a BCMA bispecific a second line. I didn't mention that because in the UK we restricted our fourth line because of the uh, th three prior therapies um, label indication. So that's great that you can access that second line. No, sorry, I, I, I didn't mention that, but I was thinking in a fourth line therapy, not in a second line. Oh, okay. Because I think the, the clinical situation we're yeah, at yeah. is... It's in fourth line, line approved. Okay, so, so if we've got to the fourth line and the patient is BCMA naive by the, yes. by the time they get to that, then of course but both, both bispecifics are, are, are very effective. I mean, my, my take on them is that the efficacy looks very similar. If you look at the overall survival that I showed you, the, the overall survival is about 22 to 24 months and the response rate is between 60 and 65%. There's a slight difference in the PFS, but I'm not sure that's real because these are single arm phase one, two studies. The toxicity profiles are almost identical um, and the delivery method is also identical. The, the bit that's slightly different is that teclistamab is a weight-based dosing and l is, is a flat-based dosing. And your hospital may have a preference in terms of the delivery of it simply on that. But otherwise, to me, they're very similar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. So we, we have also a few questions from uh, the uh, QR code from the app. And a uh, few questions. So I'll try to summarize uh, many of these questions. And thank you really for sharing your thoughts, guys. Uh, whether using an anti-BCMA therapy would prevent using another one. So for instance, if you have used an anti-BCMA CAR T cell, I guess we would be able to use a bispecific, or if you start with belantamab, you would still be able to use a bispecific or a CAR T cell. Do you confirm, both of you? Yeah, I think, of course, you know, we are still in the process of learning really about, uh, you know, the optimal sequencing there. I think there is encouraging data from uh, multiple sources that they, there are still responses and there can still be deep responses as well. Uh, by sequencing BCMA-directed therapies. Um, it seems to be, I mean, the data seems to be indicating that potentially after a bispecific antibody, the response rates then going to other BCMA-targeting therapies such as CAR T-cells or uh, um, uh, conjugates might be a bit lower. Um, it's, uh, I think, too early to be really absolutely definitive about this. So probably in the sequencing, the other way around, so maybe you know, thinking about ADCs first and or CAR T cells first and then bispecifics seems at the moment to be probably what the data uh, is indicating. But I would say uh, unless you have very clear proof and there are, is very nice data and I think you should, uh, or we, we might go through some of this later as well, is, uh, you, there are, is some testing indicating we can probably test for whether BCMA gets lost. It's not really something that's widely available in my diagnostic lab or I think many others. Of course, if such a test shows there is no BCMA left anymore on the cell, I guess then any of these treatments will probably be highly problematic. But generally, the data indicates that there can be responses. 
Wonderful. Thank you. So we have a comment from the audience, and uh, I really appreciate this comment. Obviously, we're discussing about treatments which are mainly available in the rich and uh, in the rich countries, and obviously, uh, for low and middle income countries, the story can be a little bit more complicated. And I do agree, obviously, some options mentioned uh, PCD, promalidomide, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, because promalidomide is becoming a, gener a generic drug, uh, PVD also, uh, but I think we have all to advocate for accessibility, availability, and affordability. So thank you for raising uh, uh, this uh, issue. So going back to uh, CAR T cells, for instance, and obviously, uh, at least here in France, our common practice would be whenever possible, although it may not be possible <laughs> frequently, to favor CAR T cells over other uh, options. Uh, uh, and usually patients like it. They like the CAR T cell and they heard about it in the news and everywhere. So are you concerned these days about what we are hearing, especially uh, for Silta cell, about um, the emerging toxicities, the Parkinson's and like, uh, the MNTs, the my risk of myeloid neoplasm, 1.6%, yeah. not a huge number, but still. So, so I mean, this is a uh, quite a complex area, and I think the first thing is you have to remember what this what silt cell is and the efficacy of it. I think I showed you that the um, progression-free survival in CARTITUDE 2 was 36 months, and in CARTITUDE 4 there was a significant uplift in progression-free survival. We don't have the median yet, but there was a hazard ratio, I think, about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. The second point is that just at the IMS meeting in Rio um, last week, Maravie Mateus also showed the latest data showing a significant improvement in overall survival for patients receiving silta cell compared to standard of care. And uh, that was a very high improvement in, in overall survival. We haven't got the subgroup analysis yet of the second versus third and fourth line, but overall there's a substantial improvement in overall survival. So I think overall the data is favoring silta cell use at early relapse. But of course we cannot for, re remove the fact that there is a problem. And the problem is that there's an increased risk of hematological second malignancies, which is apparent in the silta cell arm and is not present in the, um, the standard of care arm. And then there are these late motor neurotoxicities. It's a low percentage, but it does exist. What appears to be the case is that if you can manage the T cell expansion that happens, then that co correlates with the reduction in the motor neurotoxicities. And it was interesting, we had some very interesting discussions at IMS about maybe giving early tocilizumab and corticosteroids when the, when the CAR-T expansion happens to try and reduce that. So I think we're still in the learning phase. I think it is a concern, but I think you just have to balance this all out. Overall, I think the risk-benefit profile is in favour of silta cell uh, when you look at this all, but it needs to be carefully uh, taken out. But I guess if we prevent proliferation of the CAR T cells, we may lose the well, spectacular efficacy. Yeah, so I think it depends on how big an expansion you need. Um, so with the very big expansions of silta cells seem to be associated with the motor neurotoxicities. I don't think you need it. And the other point, Mohammed, is about bridging therapy. So if uh, early lines of therapy, you can give effective bridging therapy, and then so you, th you don't need such a massive expansion in the, in the CAR product. So, although, we'll take one last question from the QR code. Although the title is about BCMA-directed therapies, but for the sake of fairness, uh, I would like to take these couple of questions, whether you see any room, Martin, for talketamab, anti-GPRC5D in the patient I proposed, or although it's not approved yet or available, sevostamab, the anti-FCRH5. Mm. Any thoughts on this? I mean, on the, on the last one, I think FCRH5 is just very early in development still. I think it's very difficult to say where its place will be. I personally am very excited about it. I think, you know, it will be very likely, if, if we can get it safely into the armamentorium, a very valuable drug. I think Telquetumab inherently is a more complex story because it comes with um, a very uh, off-target but uh, paramechanism side effects. So we are unlikely to get rid of them by learning more about it. It's because GPRC5D is expressed on 
uh, epithelial cells and patients can get dysgeusia, can get weight loss, can get uh, nail changes, hair changes. Um, now that all sounds like a horror cabinet, not everyone gets this, and of course it is a very good drug. I think we, shouldn't, we should never, never uh, you know, um, discredit drugs just uh, simply only because of their side effects, and we are still learning on dosing on this, but I think on balance I would reserve that for later lines of therapy because of the side effect profile at the moment. Excellent, thank you very much, and I do agree with you. We, until we cure every single myeloma patient, guys, we need all drugs, and actually the challenge is to learn how to use them and how to minimize the side effects.